Uh, we've got really one really significant agenda item uh, to work on. <clears throat> uh, Joe, I'll ask you the usual, uh, have we, does this meeting comply with all the requirements of the South Carolina uh, Freedom of Information Act? It does. All right, let the record so, so indicate. <clears throat> First item of business, we want to approve the minutes from the December 7th meeting, which I distributed, I think, with this uh, reminder, and I think I distributed it back in December. Uh, anyone have any comments, questions, suggestions, or revisions? No, nope. fine I have to a me. motion to approve. I'll make that motion. I have a second. A second. All right, thank you. And the minutes are approved and I'll get them distributed to the appropriate place. <clears throat> Before I move on to the main item, I just want a, a, a quick um, update on uh, my personal situation. Um, the contract that we had back in the early December did not go through. And uh, basically it just, they wanted more than we were willing to give in the end. Uh, we gave a lot up front and when we did something, they said, no, 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 you've got to do this and that and the other. We said, we'll wait for somebody else. So we are back on the market. We do not have any change in our plans to continue with what we want to do. And that's relocate from here to the Greenville area. I mean, it's just not enough COVID down here for us. So we really got to go where there's a lot of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> it's just feeling left out, you know. Uh, <clears throat> the important part of this is there is a, a transition uh, that will happen regardless, and that's Barry Goldstein, member of council, will be taking over this committee uh, probably in uh, as of February. I will continue with the committee until it's time for us, for Lynn and me to relocate and do that. But, uh, and I'll work with Barry through all the things we have to work through. I will continue through the DRC exercise uh, that we are going to talk about. <clears throat> and uh, and then we'll have Barry step, step in and take over the rest in February. Any questions about what's happening, what we plan? Nope. Okay. I thank you all for putting up with all this stuff. <clears throat> All right. Our main purpose here today is to go over the DRC exercise that we have planned for January the 27th. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about the exercise from, a from the perspective or the point of view of uh, what we would like to see as a result of doing the exercise what we think about this scenario. Scott's done a nice job for us again uh, to uh, <clears throat> what we think about approaching the scenario that way and whether it will accomplish all the things we want to accomplish. And uh, I also want to talk a bit about logistics because this will be, as far as I know anyway, and Scott, you correct me if I'm wrong, the first time we've had a virtual DRC meeting We've always been able, for example, to get together at town hall and even if necessary for the exercise, break out into small groups and work on, on different items with respect to the uh, scenario. Um, I'm not so sure I know how we can do that here. <clears throat> Somebody understands Zoom a lot better than I might be able to say, oh yeah, there's a provision, there's a capability for doing that. Or we don't necessarily have to use Zoom. We can use whatever uh, congregating app we have. Mm. Um. All right, any questions so far? Skip, I was just going to say we did have a DRC meeting back in May. Uh, yes, we that did. We held, that we held via Zoom. Um, so we, we have done one before. This will be the first exercise, exercise. that we will that is correct. do. Um, and we, we will have the ability, I, I need to, to check it out and, 
and look at doing it, but there is um, some functionality in Zoom because I know as part of that meeting, we um, uh, break out into uh, to smaller teams or, or breakout sessions. Uh, I know there's a way to do that in Zoom where each individual um, session can be broken out with subgroups. So I, I just need to look at and figure out, figure out how to do that. But I, I know there is capability of doing that. Hey, Joe, this is uh, Scott Cave. Hi, everyone. Um, right, my Scott. thought was, hi, everyone. Um, my thought was we, we might need to use a different platform. Um, and, and I was thinking blue jeans just because I have that capability in blue jeans and I've done that before. Um, so if, if that's an option, we, I can send everyone instructions on how to download and use blue jeans. Um, I'm not sure if we, if you set up zoom as the host, um, with big breakout rooms, if I'll have the ability to, um, facilitate them the way I would need to. So I, we can talk about that offline if we need to, but there are a few different options I think we could use. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is because we would expect to have a uh, quorum of council present, it would constitute a public meeting. So we would have to um, sync it and broadcast it um, to our YouTube channel. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Well, then let's figure out how we can make that work. Okay. Everyone has a copy of uh, Scott's proposed plan for the exercise, correct? <clears throat> Let's take a look for just a moment at the objectives that we've listed here. There are four of them. Have they sufficiently covered what we want to cover in, in the exercise? In other words, are there some other objectives that we don't have here? Uh, one of the things that I wanted to <clears throat> talk about, we just kind of talked about a bit, and maybe it fits it within objective three, um, COVID or no COVID, the scenario could end up having us without any communications at all. And that's one of the things I think we wanted to put into the exercise plan. And I think we've sufficiently covered that one. Comments there? Skip, uh, yes. what about uh, having some bullhorns uh, available to the various entities, uh, which they could get on their own? Because sometimes that can be effectively used. Yeah, it certainly can be. And um, I think, well, I know the fire department has um, not to say a handheld bullhorn, but a loudspeaker in some of their vehicles that they've used previously. Right. I can't remember if, if the CERT team has a like a handheld bullhorn. We'd have to check. Um, I don't think we have anyone from CERT on the call, do we? I'm on it, but I couldn't answer the question. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah, good, I'm on good it. question. I'm not sure, but we can find out. Yeah. yeah just by checking yeah. the trailer sure i mean those are the types of of topics we'll be discussing during the exercise you know how, how do we effectively communicate and broadcast messages when normal lines of communication are down um, and it'll be a bit of um, brainstorming for a working group within the participants of the exercise that would be a breakout discussion that would kind of talk through all those different options then present back to the larger group. Um, in the, I'm not sure if during the hurricane exercises or not, but I, I always know that with hurricane, there's a whole huge discussion about the aftermath cleanup. Is that any part of this or is that something that's done separately or or do we just assume that it would be this basically the same and the same cost? 
I would think that <clears throat> in an earthquake scenario, a lot of the cleanup would be other than trees, shrubbery. It's going to be broken up concrete. It's going to be, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm not sure that our contract with Phillips and Jordan, for example, covers that kind of debris removal. I guess I think you misunderstood my question. My question is, is should when we in the past when we've done the hurricane exercise is discussion of the aftermath cleanup is that the last part of the hurricane exercise because that's not here on the earthquake and I didn't know if that is supposed you know if if that's the time when that's discussed at this, like, do we do that with the hurricane? Should, do we do that then if we have an exercise on earthquake, begin discussing what kind of um, uh, cleanup effort we would have to think about getting it, contracts for before it happens? Like we do. Yeah, so I, I, I can address it from my perspective. Um, it, it's certainly a good point. What I'm trying to do is uh, determine where we can best spend the limited amount of time that we have for the exercise. So um, you know, based on my discussions with Skip, um, I decided that you know, we, we probably don't have time to get into all that. We're really focused on the first you know, five or so days uh, after an earthquake. Um, there are lots of other priorities that we'll be focused on during those first a uh, few days, and um, you know, with the time that we have, I just don't think we'd have time to get into all the cleanup and recovery that could take weeks and months after the earthquake. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you want to include that as a focus area, we'd probably have to take something out to be able to add that one in. Uh, but I do think it's worth spending time on in the future. You know, we could have, for example, a recovery um, exercise in the future that focuses more on the issues that you raised as, as opposed to the immediate response issues that we're focusing on this exercise. Skip, wouldn't there be a certain degree of uh, removal of stuff to gain access to, uh, you know, create a, uh, a hospital or whatever on the island? And, you know, to what degree would the fire department be able to help you know, there, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm talking off the top of my head and not from some vast experience or depth of knowledge or anything else, but it seems to me there, there, there are two pretty plain situations here. One is that the earthquake is located such that it, it only affects, like, for example, uh, Wabala, our part of John's Island, Seabrook, Kiowa, Wabala, and not much of the surrounding area. That's, that's one thing. The other thing is it, it's obviously the, the, uh, the center of the, of the earthquake could be up around Somerville or whatever and have a very wide effect on the, on the Tri-County area. In scenario one, <clears throat> where it's just us, we're likely to have all kinds of help because they don't have much of anything else to do. They can really concentrate on helping the areas that are hardest hit. Scenario two, <clears throat> I'm not so sure. They've got a lot to do in that and they might not be able to, to get to us in as timely a fashion or manner as we would like, <clears throat> but we would certainly be coordinating with them uh, to get our priorities uh, understood at the uh, county EMD level. Is that out of whack, Scott? No, I don't, th I don't think so. I, although uh, I do believe that most of um, what Ed's talking about would be done internally, you know, with on-island resources at the time. Um, and, and you're right, we would have to work through um, possibly some initial clearing of, of debris to the extent possible to make make our way to areas that we had pre-designated for 
you know, different activities, whether it be medical attention or, um, you know, food and water distribution or whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think there'll be some of that, but I don't think there would be a mass uh, cleanup effort uh, within the first few days. It would just be limited to those specific areas of need. <clears throat> we're, we're concentrating on, uh, I think anyway, identifying um, who needs help from a first aid or whatever kind of medical assistance, uh, making sure we've established however we can <clears throat> communication so that we can actually talk to the people who can get resources to us that we need. And then I move on to <clears throat> cleanup. Well, I mean, I'm not worried about cleanup until I've got, to me anyway, the basis of a well-oiled machine working that knows we got to go here, we got to tend to that, got to go here, attend to that, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Did I lose everybody? No. 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 <clears throat> Scott, as I look at the plan, I would like to <clears throat> pass it on to the members of the DRC so that they can look at it and they can know what's basically the outline of what's coming and what we want to do so they're, they're somewhat prepared, uh, having their material handy, et cetera. I think I said that in the, in the invitation I sent out, but... Uh, I'm not giving the store away by sending this out ahead of time. Oh, no, no, not at all. No, it's, it's fairly standard for us to send this out ahead of time. So, yeah, no problems there at all. Okay. Eddie, you sent a note to me a week or so ago um, about lunch break. Yeah, I just thought, uh, Skip and Scott, um, that 15 minutes, uh, some people would want to eat something because we're not breaking or finishing until about two o'clock or thereabouts. And I just didn't know if it could be stretched to a half hour without disrupting the program. Yeah, we can, we can certainly accommodate that. Um, my only concern with uh, a half hour break virtually is uh, the risk of potentially losing some people, you know, them right. not coming back after the break. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly am happy to accommodate that or even add another 15 minute break at some point later on in the agenda. However you think that would best fit. My two cents. <laughs> There is <clears throat> always the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my goodness, always the possibility of turning your video on while you're eating your sandwich, if that's, you know, and, and still participating in it. That was a joke, obviously a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> Would you, uh, do you all think that we should increase that break to 30 minutes or add a, a second 15 minute break? I agree with you that Scott, that uh, <clears throat> if we let a break go longer than 15 minutes and we're not together physically in a group, it'll be, we'll <clears throat> lose quite a few folks, I think. So I don't wanna make it any longer than that. The idea of a second break. Where would you put it? Uh, uh, well, I guess it might have to be between uh, after the day two priorities, you know, at 1245 to one o'clock. Comments? No, I think that would be a good idea. That's closer to lunchtime for many people. So 
So we're going to put another 15 minute break between day two and day three to five. Yeah. And I'll condense day three to five um, to a shorter, you know, 30 minute time frame. It'll, it'll just be a, a quick discussion of those priorities. We will have touched on all those issues in day one and two anyway. So I think it's okay to condense that. Anyone from the rest of the group have anything to add to that? <clears throat> what is your feeling? I'm going to go around and poll each member. What is your feeling about the exercise overall? Is this going to be productive? It's going to do what we hoped it would do as we've talked about it leading up to this from back in November and December. Frank, what do you think? Yeah, just looking at the uh, agenda, you, you've got the opportunity to discuss everything that we had previously said we wanted to touch. So yeah, I think it's fine. <clears throat> Art? I'm still learning, uh, so I, I would yield to the Majority opinion. Any? No, I think it covers it very effectively, and that's what we talked about trying to accomplish. Liz. Yeah, I think I I think that the exercise looks good. I think it, based on the last earthquake exercise that we did. I think it will be a challenge to keep it on track because it's just so, and the last one was kind of difficult to keep it on track. And it went, it, it uh, went a lot of different directions, if I remember. So I think it's going to be a challenge to keep it on track, especially since it's early on. The, er, the um, hurricane dis, uh, drills that I've attended over the years, each one has gotten better and better and, and more smooth and uh, concise and precise. So we all have more experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I, I, your point's well taken, Liz. And um, there's no doubt that an earthquake is the most complex and challenging event uh, to work through as an exercise, which um, also speaks to why it's so important that we do it. Uh, but at the same time, you're right, there's so many, there's no time to prepare for it just happens you know, without any notice. There's mass chaos very quickly, all sorts of different needs and issues to deal with. Um, so what I'm trying to do is kind of focus our attention on just a few of those needs and priorities rather than trying to address everything. Um, so you see there's very little uh, talk about some of the search and rescue and life safety and and how we do all those different things. We, we've addressed those in previous uh, exercises, uh, specifically for earthquake. So we're really gonna focus on, again, coordination, resources, and communications. Um, and some of that we'll touch on, you know, how we use those things around search and rescue and some of the other issues, um, but we won't be going into detail about how we uh, send people out in teams to search for people maybe injured, how we treat the injured, um, again, th those issues have been addressed previously. So we're really trying to narrow our focus on, on these core issues this time. And hopefully that will help us um, stay more focused throughout the exercise. I'm sure part of the exercise will be <clears throat> very early on. <clears throat> we make an assessment, we start using, start understanding what our priorities should be so that we know how to allocate the time and resources. <clears throat> That's what I would think anyway, going into it, if this were an actual earthquake, you know, we don't even know where everybody is. That's right, that's right. So I'll have to provide information um, that will allow us to, you know, use some fictional information about what, what the assessment teams found, um, and then everyone can start to discuss, you know, what the priorities and issues are based on the, the fictional information I provide. 
Joe, do you have any comments about what we're planning in the exercise? No comments. Mary, comments? Uh, no comments. Okay, then I assume that everyone is in favor of <clears throat> what we have here for the exercise, the outline, and uh, Scott will just put in that uh, second break. And I, I think you've got the master file for that. I do, yep. Yeah. I'll, I'll make the change and I'll send it to you, Skip. Send it on to me and I'll distribute it to the TRC as soon as possible. Are there any Sounds other questions good. that people have about what we want to do on the 27th? Either what we want to accomplish or how we expect to go about accomplishing it. This is it, guys. This is, this is where we nail it down. We got it. Yep. OK. Thank you all for that. That's good. Is part of that the discussion of the earthen god. I'm sorry, on the what? Um, is part of the exercise going to be discussing the earthen bridges on Seabrook and that we got the diagram of where parts of the island would potentially be? Oh, I can, I'm pretty sure I can count on Scott to throw a few broken bridges in our way along the way. <clears throat> Do, I thought that whoever put the the, this diagram together. I thought that was well done. Do we have, is there any way to identify, do we have any um, large uh, land mass on Seabrook that was man-made that's not now? Um, like a, a levee or uh, uh, maybe riprap or yeah, like or in any any area that was filled, filled. like like about half of Charleston, is there any no. area on Seabrook that's not that was created or f with fill that we know of? Other than the golf course, I'm not aware of any. Frank, was that you? You're breaking up. I'm sorry. Other than the golf course, I think it was uh, 16 or 17 on uh, uh, the back nine there of uh, Ocean Woods. We, we do have the seawall, if you want to call it that, which you know goes along from, I don't know, somewhere around Boardwalk 4 or 5, around and by the club and around the, the bend up the Edison. And that would be interesting if we had a breach there because of an earthquake. And how serious, and we don't have enough people to keep their fingers in that one. Oh. Um, I think one of the comments from the December meeting was asking whether or not some of the bridges, Joe, I think you were posing this question. How many of the bridges have, are based on earthen underworks? Wouldn't be the bridge itself, obviously, but it would be the roads leading to the bridge on either side. I didn't get that right. I guess Joe's gone for a minute. But that was, we were concentrating at first on the bridge at, at uh, the Hallover, which is just a getting onto and getting off of Seabrook Island and Kiowa. And then somebody mentioned how many bridges we have just on Seabrook Island itself. And that's what led to the, the diagram that we put together. Correct. I'm not aware of any levees. Sorry, Skip, I was just gonna say, uh, I plan on using that diagram to uh, describe the different uh, bridges uh, that would likely be impacted by the earthquake, you know, in terms of damage or failure. So if anyone's aware of any others that should be added to that list, uh, I'd certainly be happy to, to hear those. List of that 
I'm not that, sure here. that was just my question was, be, you know, because any, any, um, my understanding from attending this, uh, from this earthquake speaker that we had a few years ago was that any man-made fill, any man-placed fill, no matter how old it is, is, um, is at risk when there's an earthquake. So not just including uh, earthen bridges, but also if there's any large areas of seabrook that were filthy. You just went quiet, Liz. I just wondered if there were any other filled areas because they would also be at risk. Yeah. Well, you, you are correct that um, man-made man fill is much more susceptible to liquefaction um, than natural ground. Um, and I would say that probably a lot of the um, residences and homes around Seabrook Island, especially the ones built in the last, say, 20, 25 years, have some level of fill underneath them, underneath the foundations that were was brought in. So to me, that's probably the greatest risk is, you know, a lot of the homes could have uh, liquefaction under their foundations um, that could cause obvious, you know, uh, damage and other problems. I'm not aware, Liz, of any significant areas on Seabrook Island that basically fill to reclaim land from, from the water. I'm, I, I don't think we did anything like that. I'm not as familiar with what happened in the 70s and 80s. Well, I was just thinking as preparing for the scenario, uh -huh. you know, to think about, well, what, what would Seabrook, what could Seabrook uh, physically look like if, if you took away all of the man-made uh, fill and the man-made bridges and for the scenario, probably look like a lot of unconnected little islands. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess that's my question. Have we addressed all of those uh, bridges that are likely to be impacted? Um, or are there others that we should add to the list that Skip's already um, provided in his diagrams? See, the, the only bridges I would say are bridges over in the on the golf courses to get over where there's marshy areas. But, you know, unless the golf courses became pivotal in moving, you know, people around, et cetera, um, you know, I don't think it's the same as the road bridges on Seabrook Island Road, et cetera. The, the, uh, the, I, don't, I don't play golf, so I'm not familiar with the courses, I guess, but the issue would be if, People are out there while this happens, which is a very likely thing. How many of them could be isolated and have no way of getting to uh, to safety? Would it be difficult to just print a map of Seabrook and have some people look at it and go, "Okay, we had a major earthquake," and say, "Well, now this is gone and this is gone and this is gone and this is gone and then create a potential aftermath map and then use that in the uh, exercise that okay all these points uh they're now gone because you know they're potentially they could be gone and then use that as the exercise map i am hoping from my perspective and scott will add his i'm sure that that is the first thing that people start asking for in the exercise, do we have something we can use as our assessment tool to document what we think is going on and keep it updated as opposed to providing it ahead of time, have it in our back pocket for the exercise. But if nobody's asking for it, I think that's a real hole in our procedure. I overstate yeah, I, that. No, I, I understand what you're saying, Skip, but I think to Liz's point, I do plan on uh, displaying a map of, of Seabrook 
you know, with some indicators of where the damage has occurred and, and specific, specifically damage to roads, bridges, and so forth. But um, I'll be relying on information provided by, you know, SKIPS uh, specifically or any other members of this committee um, that would help provide me with some realistic uh, intelligence, I guess, as to what the likely uh, failure points are. Otherwise, I'll just be, you know, making things up based on my own uh, limited knowledge of, of the community, especially infrastructure, you know, um, artifacts and so forth. I don't know where all the bridges are and, and where those uh, vulnerabilities are. So if anyone has any suggestions or uh, wants to provide some further input uh, into that map, I'd be happy to receive that through email or, or else, however else you'd want to convey it to me. Steve Hirsch would probably be the best resource for that at POA. I, I agree. Um, <clears throat> what about uh, getting uh, the uh, information from uh, either Sean Hardwick or Caleb on any bridges on uh, the golf courses that could be significant? In many cases, you could turn around and get back because, um, you know, knowing both courses quite well, you're not, once the bridge goes down, there is a way to, to leave that area for the most part. Yeah, I'm not sure the, uh, the golf course is probably, um... That, that could be a, a bit of a rabbit hole for us where we could spend a lot of time and maybe not get a, a whole lot of value when looking at the big picture. So I think maybe limiting our focus to the, the roads and bridges that would be used for you know, regular uh, vehicular transportation or um, otherwise would, would probably better suit us with the limited time that we have. So if Steve Hirsch is the right person, I'd be happy to, to reach out to him directly unless one of you would rather do it. Any other comments or questions? I, I think that having a, an engineer look at a map and point out weaknesses would be really good, not just for this exercise, but for going forward. I, I could just see that as being a, a useful tool. Barry, you wanna discuss your background? <laughs> well, I, I am an engineer and I happen to be a geotechnical civil engineer and I've happened to see the aftermath of several earthquakes, Haiti, uh, Honduras, uh, Southern Caribbean down by Bequia. They had an earthquake eight or 10 years ago. So I, I've seen the aftermath. Um, well, I, I do know quite a bit about earthquakes and what happens. So I, I suppose I could be a little, little help here. Um, it's hard because everyone I think is, is equating earthquakes with hurricanes and a hurricane's easy, it's coming, you get two weeks, you've been through it, everybody knows what to expect and it's just a matter of the intensity. Uh, the problem with an earthquake is everyone's looking at all these things like the bridges are gonna collapse. Uh, typically, and I heard everybody talking about liquefaction Typically, that doesn't happen. Um, and I heard Skip say about a small earthquake versus a bigger, a localized one. Seabrook's most at risk if they have an earthquake they had in Charleston, a, a really large earthquake that rattles the entire region. Small earthquakes don't do anything. I mean, we probably have a small earthquake three or four times a year. Nobody even feels here. Um, if we have a large earthquake, the biggest risk to Seabrook is being permanently isolated because the two main bridges off of Johns and James Island will become disabled. That the local bridges on Seabrook, they won't happen. It, it just doesn't happen. Even the, the culverts that the bridge you call bridges, but they're mostly just culverts. If they settle, if you get a foot of settlement, they'll still be passable. And they can be repaired within hours with somebody with a, a large uh, front end loader and some fill would level them off. 
it would be even if the dike, what you call the dike at at the the club, uh, unlikely that would collapse. Uh, they just don't. I mean, even if something happened, it's not an emergency because there's no there's no. Uh, we don't have tsunamis here. Nothing's going to come. So you'd have time to think about, well, how you want to fix it. Like I said, the biggest concern here would be if the two bridges went out and it took a while, if it was a major earthquake, it would take a long time for DOT to get a structural engineer to go look at those bridges to tell you it's okay to pass. So you could be here for weeks, two weeks, mm -hmm. while, while some structural engineer goes through that bridge piece by piece trying to say it's okay to pass. And then the other thing is that typically in earthquakes, utilities go out. Ha houses don't collapse, wood houses don't collapse. They, they may settle, they may crack, but, and trees don't typically fall down. What you get is utilities going out, water, sewer, <laughs> power, everything goes out because utilities aren't set up for a little bit of settlement here and there, they're just not. The wastewater treatment plant would go out. That's the problem, that's the problem. I mean, if you've seen, countries that have had this happen, typically the first couple of days, everybody's like, oh, we're okay, we're okay, nothing bad happens. But then what happens is there's no water, there's no sewer, there's no way to get water or sewer back here because if the two bridges went out, how do you get through here? And that's, those are the outcomes of a large earthquake. A small earthquake, sure, you could have settlement and roads and you could have houses that have some settlement cracks and all that stuff. But it wouldn't affect life as you, you know, it's not going to be a huge, you know, oh my God, we're going to have a disaster. We need to, we need to figure out what's going to go on. It's an inconvenience. Um, but if there's a big earthquake, the real problem is you could be isolated for weeks until somebody realizes, holy crap, you know, we can't get off the island because there's only two ways to get off the island, the, the two bridges. And those become, now the one bridge both bridges are relatively recent, and both bridges should withstand a large earthquake. I mean, they've been designed, both bridges have been designed to withstand earthquakes. So it's, it's, it would be the unthinkable earthquake that shakes the hell out of the bridge. So, um, and if that happens, again, that, that's the problem with earthquakes. If, if it really shook the area to the point where those bridges were concerned, well, then my guess is every bridge in Charleston, every bridge everywhere would be have a problem. And then the, like I said, then the problem is it could be weeks before they get a structural engineer to okay you driving across that bridge, you know? So maybe they let, let emergency equipment go across the bridge, but th that's the problem I see. So you, as I listen to you, you don't see, uh, I don't, when I see pictures of earthquakes, I look at buckled pavement and, you know, huge chasms that have developed as a result, et cetera, et cetera. You don't think that would be a factor here? It would be, but it's more of a, that is the scenario that you need to look at because that's the scenario of, well, how do we fix that within a few days so that cars can pass and all that stuff. But buckled pavement wouldn't stop resources from off the island coming in to help you to fill. And buckled pavement's filled in 30 minutes with a front end loader. Somebody takes some fill and fills it in, then you can get across it. That, that, those type of things aren't the problem. The problem are, it problem would be is if you had an earthquake big enough that it, it didn't even knock out the bridges. You can still get it on and off, but your utilities are gone. You have no water, no sewer, no internet, no power. Those could take weeks to get reestablished. If it was big enough to do it here, it's probably gonna knock out a pretty good swath of the regional area. So like I said, there's really two. One would be the incredible earthquake that knocks the bridges out and then everyone's in trouble. Or the second one is it's big enough that it knocks the water, the sewer, the, the utilities out, and you're sitting here for weeks without water, sewer, utilities. That becomes a public health problem. The, yeah. the roads, the bridges, the culverts here, likelihood is they're not gonna be knocked out. They may be inconvenienced. There may be a culvert may settle six inches or a foot, but that doesn't stop anybody probably from fixing it within a couple hours with a front end loader by putting fill in there. Um, does does anybody know whether either the club or the uh, water utility people, uh, if either of them has a front loader? Yeah, they have equipment over there. They have they have they have heavy equipment. Okay, good to know. 
Yep. Uh, and those are the issues we'll be working through for sure um, throughout the exercise to figure out who has what and, and you know, what can be used most effectively to deal with the issues um, to allow access to the areas that require assistance. Um, I would still like to know uh, where the largest vulnerabilities are, Barry, if, if you could maybe provide your opinion as to, you know, which bridges, which part of the roads, um, so forth, are likely to have, um, you know, large areas of, of either liquefaction, sediment, whatever, that would require some sort of um, repairs or, or treatment to be able to put them back into working condition. Yeah, I mean, really every culvert, so starting from the roundabout out there, uh, every culvert would likely sell. And again, you know, if it settled a foot, is that un? Could you could you get equipment through it? I don't know. But again, those are, it would just be. You'd be surprised how many culverts we have on Seabrook. I mean, coming down Seabrook Island Road, there's several culverts. Um, so they're all over the island. I don't know exactly where they are, but every culvert's susceptible to settlement. And the question is, could you get six inches to a foot of settlement? Yeah, you could get six inches to a foot, and you'd have to fill it in at least in the short term to get cars to pass. So. That's probably the scenario that Seabrook needs to look at within the first few days is to be able to get those things filled in so people could get on and off the island, assuming that the two bridges survive. I mean, that, that has to be the assumption. If the two bridges don't survive, I don't think it's worth looking at the scenario because there's nothing we can do. If, if, if we have a serious earthquake, an, eight, an earthquake that's in the magnitude of seven and a half, eight, and the bridges become unpassable, well, then the entire region would be unpassable, and we'd all be sitting here waiting for resources from other places besides South Carolina to come rescue us. Uh, if you can't, you know, if those bridge, because if those bridges go down, then every other bridge in the area is going to go down, and we wouldn't be the only ones looking for help. Um, but yeah, you're trying to, if you have a, a reasonable earthquake like they did in Charleston and whatever it was, 18, whatever. You, you, that's a good one to look at. I mean, so masonry structures get damaged because they, they're, not, they're not meant to withstand any kind of lateral movements. Wood structures, not a problem. I don't think you, if you go back and look at history of Charleston, all the wood structures lasted no problem. I mean, sure they crack and you have drywall crack and all that stuff, but nothing collapses. So that Seabrook has almost all wood structures. Um, you know, the roads, yeah, you'd have settlement at culverts. If Again, everybody talks about liquefaction. Liquefaction really isn't the fill. Liquefaction is a certain type of soil, a clean, fine sand that if you shake it just right, it will kind of start to settle basically. And, and it takes a certain, so you wouldn't get global liquefaction across Seabrook Island. You may get certain locations and all it means is it settles. And so the question is, if it settles a foot, is that going to cause tremendous damage to everything? Probably not. I mean, if your house happens to be over something that settles a foot, sure, your house is gonna look pretty funny, but it won't collapse. The wood structure doesn't collapse. It just kind of leans and tips and stuff. So, but yeah, the culverts, because that would be the first ones to start, you'd have to start filling things in quickly to get people to be able to pass over culverts. But I really think the biggest issue would be is your water, your sewer, all utilities would be out for quite a while. And that becomes a sanitary problem. What do, you know, everyone's going to start wanting, how do I go to the bathroom? You know, I have no fresh water. That, those become two, three days out. The problem of, not that you can't go anywhere. I mean, if you can get off the island and the roads are fixed, then fine. You can drive off the island and find, you know, hotels and places upstate. But, uh, you know, that, that, that's the really the issue is that trying to convince people, don't use the toilet, don't do that stuff because, there's, there's cracks in the line. The sewage, raw sewage is just spilling out. Yeah. If you can't get them to wear a mask, they're sure as heck not going to not use the toilet. Right. And, and, that's, what you, <laughs> and that's what you see in, in other countries. People immediately after the first day or two after an earthquake realize, I'm okay. I can, things are okay. I'm okay. Except they realize no water, no sewer. And then what happens a week later they're realizing, oh my God, they have a public health problem. You know, they're not dying because of the earthquake, they're doubling because they're still using the toilets, they're still using the water, but the water system's broken, which means there's bacteria in the water, but they're still drinking it because they have no choice. 
So those are the typical things that happen after earthquakes. Barry, have you seen uh, what, what we've heard a lot from the um, local um, uh, geologists at the College of Charleston and other geotechnical engineers? Um, they, they say that for the most part, the bridges, um, the structures of the bridges should survive a moderate to, you know, like a six or a, a low seven or something like that. But um, it's the approaches, you know, again, those, those man-made fill approaches that would likely uh, be more subject to settlement, liquefaction, and so forth. So that even if you have a foot settlement, that's, that's too large of a gap to negotiate the entry and exit from the bridge structure. Um, and when you multiply the number of bridges that are likely to experience that condition, you know, it's going to take a while for uh, all the different trucks and, and front end loaders and so forth to kind of, you know, rebuild up. Um, the settled approaches and exits from the bridges. Is that something you've seen in other areas where you've studied earthquakes? Yes. I mean, that's exactly what happens. Like I said, the big bridges have been designed to take this. I mean, if the, like I said, if the big bridges really go down, we don't have anything to do with it. It would take somebody else coming in and saving us, but that's exactly what happens. The culverts, the approaches. I mean, every time you go over a bridge, you always notice you know, that just before you go to the bridge, there's always a little bit of a bump. It's because the fill does settle and shaking it is going to probably, you know, induce some settlement into that, those things. But that's exactly what happens. And that's what happened here on Seabrook, even like the bridge to, if you go around Seabrook Island Road towards Oyster Catcher, that's on piles. I don't know how deep the piles are, but if the piles are deep enough through the, through the you know, the, the sand and the organics and down to a, a, a firm layer, the bridge won't settle. The bridge won't collapse. The bridge won't do anything. Even this is such a short bridge, even in a big earthquake. But the two approaches to the bridge where there's earth that's mounded up, you're right. You'll have a settlement there. And just like the culverts, you'll have a foot, which makes it unpassable to, for an average car. So really what you'll end up doing is relying on somebody with heavy equipment running around with fill, leveling it off, assuming that the, it's a one-time earthquake and you get small aftershocks, but they don't really do much to the the, the settlements occurred. So you'll need to be going, filling it in as quick as possible to let traffic, you know, especially if you're telling people don't drink the water, don't use the, to don't use the toilets. You got to go off the Island, get off the Island to use your facilities. Then you need to get those things filled in so people can get off the Island. Okay. So um, thank you. I mean, it's been very helpful to hear your, your thoughts here. So um, in terms of getting a list of where those culverts are and, and where those bridges with those approaches are, should I be talking to Steve Hirsch or um, Barry yourself to, to no, kind of get a list of what they are? Steve Hirsch knows where they all are. I mean, he, he, yeah. he knows what's on the island and everything else. Right. So, I mean, okay. I, don't, I don't really have a, an idea. So he's the best person. Right. Okay. So I'll re again, I'll reach out to Steve, um, try to get some more details, some agreement from him on which ones we'll highlight uh, for the exercise. And, uh, and then we'll proceed with the information that he provides me. So thank you for that discussion. That was yeah, very helpful. Thank you, Barry. Any other comments or discussion about the scenario, the scenario or the exercise? <clears throat> okay. Last item on the agenda, Joe had a few things he wanted to cover with us from uh, the town perspective. Uh, Joe, you with us here? I'm here. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, just a couple items to note. Um, the uh, um, last month we brought in um, Superior Blacktop Services. I'm sure anyone who's driven to Freshfields or off the island over the last couple of weeks has probably noticed. Um, as part of our ongoing effort to uh, improve pedestrian safety at the crosswalks, you probably saw that we had. Um, um, basically ground down and re-surfaced um, the two crosswalks, the one in front of Town Hall uh, and also the one near the um, entrance to the marina. Um, so those were both um, milled, new layer of asphalt. They also went in um, and then did the stamp pattern um, to provide, uh, you know, kind of like a different texture. And they also went in uh, after all that basically, you know, cooled, settled and everything um, and um, 
painted like a brick red type color over the stamped asphalt. Uh, and then they also went in and um, put uh, some new uh, thermoplast um, bars on both sides of the uh, new, um, new crosswalks. And they will be going in, should be in the next a uh, couple weeks um, with some of those, their little triangles, like yield type triangles, um, which as someone's approaching the crosswalk, those will be located uh, basically before you hit the crosswalk in each direction, uh, basically just indicating where someone uh, should stop uh, to yield when there's someone in the crosswalk. Um, so all those with the exception of the yield triangles uh, have been completed. Uh, I, Personally, I think they look great. Uh, I think it draws more attention to the fact um, that the crosswalk is there with the different color, the different texture, the new bars. Uh, everything is, you know, uh, some of those crosswalks, if you don't get out and look at them, they were in uh, pretty poor shape. So the, um, uh, the new asphalt, I think, is a, even if we did nothing else, would be a huge improvement. Um, to the uh, safety in the crosswalks. But um, uh, I did just want to point out that, um, that that work has been substantially completed. Um, really the only other significant item that's still outstanding, uh, council had approved in 2020 um, as another additional safety measure, uh, reducing the speed limit in front of town hall, uh, basically extending the 15 mile an hour zone um, from where it stops currently at that crosswalk um, to extend it further towards the, um, the traffic circle um, by a couple hundred feet, basically past the driveway um, at Town Hall. Um, so in an effort to reduce the, um, the, the speed of vehicles traveling through that corridor, uh, also to provide a little bit more of a, a buffer uh, before you hit the crosswalk. Because right now the 35 to 15 transition takes place at the crosswalk. Um, that's where um, the town's portion and the POA's portion uh, of Seabrook Island Road connect. So by moving that speed limit further uh, away from the gate, uh, we'll provide a little bit more buffer and should improve um, safety in that location. And we do plan to do that. Um, our new budget just went into effect uh, last week, uh, 11 days or so ago. Um, in that budget, we do council approved um, funding for new signage. So as we go and um, start doing, uh, replacing the signage on Seabrook Allen Road. Um, that'll be the point at which we'll um, uh, reduce the speed in, um, in that section. So that'll really be, for the time being, the um, final uh, improvement. We're also going to look at and get some additional quotes for uh, a few other items which were not included in that first phase, um, including um, the possibility of adding some uh, uh, push button style light. So when someone's uh, approaching, uh, a pedestrian's approaching the crosswalk, they'd be able to push a button. It would illuminate some lights and alert motorists that someone's about to be uh, entering the crosswalk. So that's, that's something we'll be looking at uh, potentially for this year. But um, uh, for the most part, uh, those improvements have, have been substantially completed, uh, all but the uh, um, yield um, markers in the street and the uh, replacing the signage. Any questions or comments about the crosswalks? I think they look pretty good. Yes, I would agree. Now, if we can just get people to stop running over the um, pedestrian signs that we put in the street, that would be great. Um, the implementation of Ordinance 2014, that's the short-term rental ordinance, um, did just want to make sure everyone was aware that uh, council did adopt that ordinance at its meeting on December 15th. Uh, there were some amendments that were made at that time, but um, uh, we now do have an ordinance on the books. Um, we are beginning that uh, process to uh, transition with the um, permitting uh, inspection and enforcement uh, regime. Um, I, I did just want to point out that really the, the driving purpose of this ordinance was um, public safety. So a lot of the uh, uh, 
the overwhelming majority of the items that are written into the ordinance are intended to uh, improve public safety, uh, primarily for uh, individuals who will be um, staying in those short-term rental units, but also um, to neighboring property owners. So some of the items that, you, that you'll see in that ordinance will include um, basically having the um, required um, fire uh, smoke alarms in each bedroom, which is a, a code requirement, a current code requirement um, under the building code. Um, that if there's any sort of uh, equipment or appliance that runs off of uh, any sort of fossil fuel, um, then they would also have to have a carbon monoxide detector. Um, we would require uh, that an information packet be provided to renters either at check-in or prior to check-in. Uh, that would give information like um, community rules, special requirements. Uh, so for example, the ordinance would require, uh, if that was in place this year, that if there's you know, special requirements or, or regulations that are in effect, that I as zoning administrator would have the ability to push those out. Um, to all of the uh, individuals who own and rent properties, all the management companies, uh, and they would have to provide information. Uh, so for example, earlier this year, when we had the, um, the uh, you know, more strict requirements in place, um, you know, we could just provide a, a one page document notifying people who are coming to the island. Here's the special restrictions. Um, that are in place as a result of our emergency ordinances, for example. Um, one of which would have been if you were coming here from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, or New Orleans, you had to quarantine for 14 days. Um, you know, when that was put in place, what the ordinance would allow me to do would be to uh, have a document. We could push that document out to all the rentals. And under the ordinance, they would have to provide that to individuals when they, uh, if they were coming from one of those locations, um, or we could say you have to give it to everybody, um, that they would have to provide that when someone uh, came here. Um, but we'll also have, um, you know, they have to give information about, you know, the town's rental restrictions, parking requirements, which are new uh, in this ordinance. So you can't block a uh, fire lane, you can't block fire access, you can't block uh, someone's ability to get to or from a neighboring property. Um, you know, those would have to be provided to all renters. Um, <clears throat> we would have a um, requirement that they have a fire extinguisher in each rental unit. Um, they would have to um, post a, uh, a placard of some sort um, on either the, uh, the inside of the primary door where people travel to and from the unit or somewhere uh, adjacent to the door, um, giving information about, you know, here's the 24 hour contact for this property. Um, you know, here's where the fire extinguisher is located, uh, things like that. Um, we would require, or we will require that every short term rental unit um, have uh, an individual or company who's capable of responding within two hours. Uh, anytime there's an issue or an incident, um, that's something that we've never had before. Most of the other uh, jurisdictions around us do. Uh, and what that's intended to do is if there is an issue, there's a responsible person who's capable uh, of taking care and addressing whatever that issue is in a timely manner. Um, and then the last one I'll highlight is the fact that we will have a, um, uh, an inspection program um, to uh, um, allow town um, inspectors to uh, go into properties and observe if there's any violations. Um, we're not going to inspect every property every year like the town of Kiowa Island does, um, but we will be um, likely taking a, a sample each year. Um, so at renewal time, we'll be going in and just kind of uh, spot checking um, and then, you know, if there's a complaint, an issue or something like that, then obviously we have uh, the ability um, to conduct inspections at that point as well. Um, so all this is new 
Um, it's going to be a little, little bit of a transition, a little bit of a learning process, both for the town, our code enforcement officers, and uh, the owners and managers of, um, of those rental companies. But we're hoping to make it um, uh, as seamless as possible. Uh, and, and I will add with this and pretty much any other town ordinance, our primary objective is um, not to be punitive. We're just trying to uh, bring about compliance with the requirements in the ordinance. So, um, you know, when we go out, if it's a, a minor issue, something like that, you know, that we come across in a, a, a random inspection, um, you know, typically we're always going to provide an opportunity to uh, correct and address whatever that issue is. My, my goal, uh, ideally, we would never write a single citation. <laughs> Um, you know, we're, we're really primarily just trying to uh, bring about compliance with the requirements, much the same way that we do with the, um, uh, the, the beach um, rules and regulations and our beach patrol. Um, you know, every year they have hundreds of contacts with folks out on the beach. Um, 2020, for example, they, they gave out hundreds of warnings, only one citation. So our, our our hope and our goal is to treat this in, in pretty much the same way. Um, really more than anything, we, we wanna have something on the books. So if there is an issue, we have tools at our disposal uh, to, to bring about compliance, but um, um, you know, we're not gonna be going out actively looking to uh, punish or you know, suspend or revoke someone's ability to rent. Any questions about that ordinance? All right, here and none. The last item I will briefly discuss is we have received an, uh, an application from uh, the PGA. Um, they are um, finalizing their parking plans for the 2021 PGA Championship uh, at the Ocean Course in Kiowa. Uh, as they did uh, back in, I think it was 2012, uh, they are planning to have um, off-site parking and shuttles running from the, uh, basically the area, it's the Hallover Creek property uh, between Seabrook Island, runs behind Fresh Fields over to Kiowa Island. Uh, and they're seeking for the duration of the tournament um, to allow um, two access points um, to that off-site parking area. Uh, one would be on Seabrook Island Road, which is the one that they're uh, requesting the encroachment permit for. Uh, the other one would be off of Kiowa Island Parkway. Um, and really having two allows them to, uh, you know, better distribute the traffic um, throughout the area. Of course, there's gonna be a lot of people um, Potentially, I and mean, at this point, we don't know if COVID is going to have any uh, impact on that event. But you know, if the event went forward as as planned, um, you know, there's likely going to be thousands of vehicles coming out uh, to Seabrook and Kiowa um, every day. Uh, and having um, two access points to that offsite parking area um, would, just from a public safety standpoint, allow for better distribution uh, of the traffic. Um, you know, we could easily sit here and say, well, no, it's at Kiowa, all the traffic should come and go from Kiowa. Well, what's gonna happen in that situation is it's gonna back up into the traffic circle in, in all likelihood. And, um, you know, so yeah, we may not have the traffic on Seabrook Island Road, but if you can't get from Seabrook Island Road into the traffic circle and up at to Garrison onto Johns Island, you know, what have you accomplished? So uh, I, I think in the grand scheme of things from a public safety standpoint, it will be beneficial um, to have that secondary access on Seabrook Island Road. Um, I mean, yes, it will be a, a, an inconvenience for a week or so, but um, uh, I think having one is going to be uh, better than not having one uh, just because of what that would mean to uh, the traffic circle, to Betsy Carrison Parkway and whatnot. So um, that request is going, um, we, we have it scheduled to go to the planning commission uh, on Wednesday of this week at the regular meeting. Uh, I'm expecting that 
this meeting will just be kind of more introductory Q and A, those type things. Uh, and then we'll likely bring the request for approval uh, at the February planning commission meeting. Um, but I did just want to bring that to your attention. I, I, I have copies of the traffic study. If anyone would like to see those, I'd uh, be happy to, uh, uh, to distribute those via email. But I, I, I did just want to make sure you were all aware uh, of um, the, that that was coming forward. Uh, happy to answer any questions about that or any of the items that I uh, discussed this morning. <laughs> I don't know, Skip, talkative bunch this morning. <laughs> All right. uh, any other items that, any old business that uh, we need to go back? Any new business items that we should discuss that I didn't include on the agenda? All right, then, I think that covers everything on our, on our agenda for today. Our next meeting is going to be February 8th, um, and I think we'll dedicate a lot of that to reviewing the DRC exercise. So uh, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to uh, meet today and to, for being a part of the committee. It's, uh, your volunteering is, is the heart of what we get done here on Seabrook Island, and uh, we couldn't get things done without you. So thank you very much. And with that, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. All right. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second. All right. Thank you very much. Everyone have a good day. Have a safe week, safe month, safe year. So long. Take care. Thanks. Bye now. Thanks. Thanks, Skip. <clears throat>